Hey, my name is uh, my name is BJ. Uh, thank you, thank you. I'm the uh, I'm the associate pastor here at Thrive Church. Uh, my family and I started coming here in 2019, and we love what Thrive Church is about. And I want to tell you, if if you're just visiting here, something you need to know about our church is awesome things are happening here. And I believe as we continue to honor God with the things that we do and how we live, that He's going to continue to wow us with how He uses us and how He impacts people's lives as a result of what we're doing here. And I'm very excited about that. Now, there's a lot of you here that I don't know, so I'm going to start out by quick introducing myself, and then at the same time, I'm going to kind of share what God has put on my heart with me to share with you here this morning. But uh, to start out, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to moms. Happy Mother's Day to you guys, right? It's amazing. Moms are very cool. I have one as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm a second-hand observer to the fact that motherhood is not easy. Motherhood is not easy, so I want to acknowledge on the front end that motherhood is difficult, especially if you were my mom. Uh, my mom's name is Dawn, and uh, she uh, recently told my kids a story about me growing up that uh, my kids can't get enough of, and they want me to tell them over and over again. And I can't verify whether it's true or not, but she says that we went to the doctor for a routine checkup one time, uh, and the doctor at some point in the checkup noticed that I had multiple pair of underwear on, like three, four, five pairs of underwear on. And so mom calls me over and she says, hey, you know, why you got a whole bunch of pairs of underwear on? And I told her, I said, well, I figured uh, I was going to get spanked at some point today, so I wanted to be prepared for when that time happened. <laughs> And so my kids love that story, and I'm giving them tips uh, for how to live. So uh, speaking of my mom, uh, a little over a week ago, we got to visit my parents. They live in Ohio, and here's a family picture that we took while we were there. Uh, that's mom and dad and, and our family. I love my family. Uh, I also have an older sister and a younger brother. Both are married. Both have kids. Uh, but my mom was a big influence in my life growing up, big influence in my spiritual life as well. She prayed a lot for me and my siblings, which was absolutely necessary for us to make it to adulthood. And so she prayed a lot for us, and she always pushed me and my brother and my sister towards what God wanted for our lives. And I didn't know it at the time, but I'm super appreciative for my mom being that person in my life. And so next to my mom is my dad. Uh, his name is Tom. Dad is one of the most talented people I've ever known. Uh, he can do just about anything, and he taught me a lot of things. Uh, and last year, we almost lost dad to a heart attack. Uh, he was just minutes away from dying, and uh, thankfully he didn't. It's a miracle that he's still alive, but just a, a side note, if you know anybody who experiences heart attack-like symptoms, you may have to bug the crap out of them in order to get them to the hospital, and that's what happened to dad. He almost didn't make it, but uh, he had open-heart surgery in October, and now he's back to being a grumpy old man again, so that's uh, good. <laughs> I tell you all of that about mom and dad to introduce you to the key point that I want you to hear this morning, and that is this. If you're still here, you have a purpose. Amen. If you're still here, you have a purpose. So some of you need to hear that today, that you're still here, you have a purpose, and you have a reason for existence, and I don't want you to forget it. I don't want you to forget it. If you're still here, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. It's nice to see little babies and think about what they could be and what God's going to do in their life, but all of us, God has a purpose for our lives, every single one of us. Now, I like a little bit of interaction here from the stage, which might be uncomfortable for you, but I'm going to coach you through it. We're going to make it. It's going to be okay. I also like to make things more personal to you. So instead of just saying, if you're still here, you have a purpose, we're going to say it like this. If I'm still here, I have a purpose, right? If I'm still here, I have a purpose. So sometimes we believe things more when we say them out loud. Here's where it's going to get uncomfortable. Are you ready? I would love it just for funsies. If any time I said the first part of that statement, you would say the second part of that statement. You tracking with me? So if I would say, if I'm still here, you would say, I'm not okay, a little bit quieter than first service, but you guys are getting there. Let's practice one more time. If I'm still here, I have a purpose. Ooh, thank you. I heard you back there. That's great. So if I'm still here, I have a purpose. The fact that you are upright and breathing means that God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you. He has a role for you to play in his great story that he is telling. And don't let anybody tell you anything different. The fact that you're still here means you have a purpose. There's no age limit, young or old. There's no mental capacity, high or low. There's no gender or race or anything else that makes it so that you do not have a purpose while you're here on this earth. Now, you just might be confused about what your purpose is at this particular season, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that could look like for you, but God has a plan for your life. 
Back to my family for a minute, because I like to brag on them. They're beautiful, aren't they? Look at those people, right? You see mom and dad. Now, the others in the picture are my wife and kids. Uh, my wife, Brittany, is absolutely amazing. If you get to know her, you would say the same thing. She's wonderful. She's beautiful. She's kind. She's caring. Uh, and she is an awesome wife and an amazing mom to our kids. We've been married now for 11 years, one month, and 22 days. And so, thank you. Thank you. And if my wife can put up with me for that long, there's hope for anybody, including you. And uh, God provided me with a great partner for life. And I love how we try to sharpen each other uh, to be better for the Lord. And uh, if there's anything you know about me and my wife, it's that we're not perfect, me especially. But God can still use imperfect people to impact others in their lives for the Lord. And uh, our marriage isn't perfect either, but God still chooses to use us to help each other grow. And so I want you to hear this morning, if you're not perfect, which I'm looking out at here, I don't see any perfect people. If you're not perfect, God can still choose to use you to make a difference in somebody's life. You just have to be willing and available to let him do so. The other youngins in the picture are three crazies, right? So they keep us on our toes. Brock is seven years old. He loves Legos. I don't know when that's going to change, but it hasn't changed anytime soon. And Bria is five. She loves uh, unicorns and metalcore music. And she's a combination that is crazy. Uh, Becker is six months old. He just started eating solid food. And so our household, there's never a dull moment. It's a really fun but also hectic stage of life. And we're trying to savor it. Because there's been so many people, seasoned people in life that tell us, man, you'll blink and it'll be gone. And so we're trying to savor every minute of all of our kids and what's going on there. And uh, as I talk about our kids, I want to give a shout out to our Thrive Kids team. The team downstairs, and I'm surprised we can't hear them through the floor, how busy it is down there. But our Thrive Kids team loves kids and investing in them for Jesus. And since we've been here, since 2019, both Brock and Bria have professed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I know that the investment that our Thrive Kids has made with them has played a part in that. They know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and when they put their faith in him, they can be saved. And so shout out to our Thrive Kids team downstairs. They are teaching our kids to know and love and serve Jesus and know that you can do that when you're five and seven years old. Because when they're still here, they have a purpose, right? I pray every day that God would bring people into my kids' lives, people that are uh, looking to invest in care and love on them and push them towards who Jesus is and whatever next step it is in their faith journey that they're going to take, I'm praying that God would bring those people. And some of those might even be people in this room. It might even be you that are going to invest in my kids' lives. And so I pray that God brings those people to invest in their lives, to help them become the men and the women that God has called them to be. Now, I tell you all this for a reason, not just to brag on my kids, although I do that sometimes too. Remember the main thing that I wanted you to know this morning? I told you not to forget it. This is that interaction time, you remember? Right? I have a purpose, right? And so if I'm still here, right? If I'm still here, I have a purpose. You guys are killing it. Great. So let's take a look at a passage of scripture that I was wrestling with this past week. And as I was thinking about this idea of why God has us all here together, why are we all in existence on the planet at the same time to interact with each other, parents and siblings and friends and coworkers and teachers and students, why are we all here in the world together? So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open up to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. If you don't have your Bible or you don't want to click on the Bible app on your digital device, I'm going to put it up on the screen for you for you to follow along. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes was written by the wisest person to ever live. His name was King Solomon. And so we would be smart to listen to wise people, right? We are smart if we listen to people who know what's going on and they're wise and they can offer us advice. And so King Solomon advises us in chapter 4, verse 9, starting in verse 9, he advises us these things. And this is what it says. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And so why are we in this world together? You and me and the other people around, why are we here? I believe we are all here together because we need each other. 
because we need each other. We need each other to live to our fullest potential. We need each other when we get into a jam, somebody can help us out. We need each other to support and encourage when we need it. We need each other to fulfill the purpose that God created us for. Now, I don't think that we're here together to go about living our our good old lives and ignore the fact that other people are here, pursuing our goals and saying, I'm going to walk all over everybody in order to get what I want. I don't think that's why we're here. I think we're here to love and invest in the lives of others. The God who created us and has a plan for us, he put us here together, which means it was intentional in order that we could help each other on our journey to become who he has created us to be. Moms helping kids, Thrive Kids teachers helping students, imperfect spouses helping imperfect spouses, grandparents helping grandkids, neighbors helping neighbors, co-workers helping co-workers. We're all here together because we need each other. We need each other. And we want to invest in the lives of others to help them reach their greatest potential. And in a surprising chain of events, When we choose to invest and love and pour into the lives of other people, we oftentimes find the reason that God created us as well. We find great meaning and purpose in our lives when we choose to invest in the lives of those around us. And I believe that's how it's God created it to be. Because if I'm still here, oh, you fell asleep on me. No, say it's not so. If I'm still here, I have a purpose. Thank you. This is the model that Jesus sets for us in Mark 10, 45. Here's what it says, follow along on the screen. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Jesus lived his life to love and serve those around him, and his primary goal in that was to point others to the Creator, to the one who created them and designed them with a purpose. Now, maybe you're here this morning, and you're wrestling with your purpose. You think maybe you're too old or you're too young to have a purpose, or maybe you're not smart enough, or maybe uh, your life isn't what it should be. It was supposed to go this way, but it hasn't gone that way. Or maybe you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, and you don't seem to add up to what they are doing, so you must not have a great purpose that they have. And I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus offers us a reminder of the fact that we have a purpose And a way for us to help remember the fact that we have a purpose, I think, has two principles to it. I'm going to share them with you here. The remedy that Jesus offers us to help us to remember our purpose starts with this. Number one, to remember that God made you on purpose and for a purpose. You need to remember that God made you on purpose, not an accident, for a purpose. Before you were born, God knew you. Before you entered this world, God knew everything about you, and he designed you for the role that you were going to play. And that's why Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, I believe he says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God prepared a purpose for your life before you were here. He even prepared good works for you to do in advance. That means he knew about your life, so much about your life, that he orchestrated events to happen while you were here for you to display the purpose he created you for, for you to display the value that you have and all the attributes that he gave you. He crafted you in such a way, in such a specific and creative and masterful way that he knew what you were going to be doing in life. He had a purpose for you. This verse also describes you as his handiwork. You're not a piece of work. You're his handiwork, right? And so he he created you skillfully. Another word for handiwork here is masterpiece, something specifically crafted with a very intentional purpose in mind. You are a masterpiece of the creator and sustainer of the universe. And you can know without a doubt that if he's the one who made you, if he's the one who designed you, that you have a purpose. You have a reason for being here. And if I'm still here, man, it must be warm. You guys, the lights are down. You're falling asleep. Don't do it to me. Don't do it to me. The second part of being reminded of your purpose is this, to serve others the way that Jesus served us. Remember the passage we talked about in the book of Mark, what he wrote in chapter 10? He said this, for even the son of man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus 
served us in the most sacrificial and loving way possible. He came to earth as a man. He lived a perfect life. He deserved all of the glory and honor. He deserved it all, but instead he chose to die on the cross to pay for the wrong things that you and I have done. Each and every one of us has gone against what God has asked of us. Every one of us is imperfect. And when you're imperfect like me, you deserve spiritual death, separation from God forever. That's what we deserve. But Jesus, because he loves us, because he cares about us, he came and he died on the cross to pay the penalty that we owe. If you and I die without a sacrifice on our behalf of a perfect person, we spend eternity in hell. But because of what Jesus did, him dying, paying for our sins, we can, if we believe in what he did on the cross for us, we can be saved. We can be saved. That's how Jesus served us lovingly and sacrificially. And that's a choice that you and I have to make. Whether we believe he did that for me or not, that's a choice you and I have to make. And you can make that at any point in your life, from when you're young and you just start to understand what sin is and what Jesus did from the last day that you're going to have breath. As long as you're here and you can make that choice that Jesus died for my sins, you can make that. And you can make that today if you want. If you don't know that Jesus died for your sins, if you've never asked him to save you from the wrong things you've done, you can do that today. And I would encourage you to. If you want to know more information about that, come see me after. I'd love to share with you what that looks like. But Jesus served us lovingly and sacrificially in that way, and he created us to live out that purpose. And as we live out that purpose that he made us for, we can follow his example and do this. We too can love and serve other people sacrificially. We can do that. We understand what Jesus did for us. He loved us sacrificially and lovingly, and we can have the perspective, if we understand that, to do that for other people, the other people around us. So here's where the rubber meets the road. How do we do that? How do we love other people sacrificially? How do we invest in their lives? How do you do that, and how do I do that? That's what we want to know this morning. First of all, I think we need to recognize the people that God has put in our lives, we have to acknowledge the people that he's surrounded us with. Look around at the people that you interact with on a regular basis. Your people are different than my people. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's a, a waiter or waitress at a restaurant that you frequent on a regular basis. Maybe it's that neighbor you see every once in a while when you're taking out the trash or getting the mail. Maybe it's that guy in the cubicle next to you at work. Or maybe it's the lady who checks the books for you at the library. Maybe it's the person that's sitting so close to you at church because the seats are full that you're starting to smell them, right? Go ahead and look at the person next to you. Awkward look at the person next to you. It's fine. It's cool, right? God has placed people in your life, and those are the same people that he's calling you to love and invest in. Those are the people that we can make a difference in their lives. And maybe you're thinking of one of those people right now. Somebody that you see on a regular basis that you're like, man, that's one of those people that I can, I can love and invest in their lives. And you're asking the question, how do I do it now? I've got somebody in my brain. Sorry. I've got somebody in my brain. How do I do it? I think it can be summed up fairly well in a few verses from the Apostle Paul in, in Philippians chapter 2. Here's what it says. Follow along on the screen. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, catch this, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's how you and I serve and love other people. We value others and consider their needs before our own. How do we do that practically? You show interest in the lives of other people. You ask them questions about things that they care about, whether that person is somebody you know well or somebody you're just introduced to. Maybe if you hear a need that that person has, you can meet that need. Or it's something that like you hear that they, they like a certain treat and you just go buy it for them and say, here, I got this for you because I thought about you. Or you go out of your way to do something nice for them. You introduce them to people that you know. Maybe you offer to pray for those people or introduce them to who Jesus is. 
You get together with somebody and you let them do most of the talking because you're valuing them and considering their needs above your own. When we do that for the people that God has put in our lives, we consider their needs before our own, we love and invest in the lives of others, that's how we do what Jesus did. We can do that. Now, if that's how all of us approach life, if me and you and everybody else approach life that way, no matter what circumstances we found ourselves to be in, I can guarantee you that if you invest in the lives of other people lovingly and sacrificially, you will find a greater purpose than you could have ever imagined. You will find a purpose and a meaning to life that you would not have found otherwise apart from investing in loving other people. Now, I can think of no greater example of somebody who loves and sacrificially gives than a mom. Would you agree? A mom is somebody who loves and gives sacrificially. Uh, They serve and they love. They consider the needs of their family over their own. They point others towards Jesus. They're on the clock 24-7. Uh, They serve until they're tired, and then they keep serving because they have to, right? Moms are awesome. But as awesome as moms are, they are not the only ones tasked to live this way. We all are. We are all here on purpose with a purpose. If I'm still here, oh, you were ready for it that time. Half of you were like, dang it, I missed the last one. What am I going to do? Sorry, you have to wait till next time. If I'm, sorry, sorry, if I'm constantly reminded of the fact that God made me on purpose and with a purpose and I choose to love and serve the other people that God has put in my life and we all do that together, man, what an amazing place this world would be if we chose to live that way. And that, my friends, I think is the whole purpose behind why we're better together. God made us, he designed us, he put us here together to invest in each other's lives and when we do that, we're better together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for creating us. God, you knew us before we were born. You designed us creatively, masterfully, the exact way that we came out. And God, you knew all about our lives and you designed us with a purpose. Sometimes, God, it's hard to remember or to understand or even know, man, what is my purpose in this life? And you, you give us examples in scripture of how best to remember that you made us, that you designed us skillfully, to do certain things in life. So God, I pray that as we're here this morning, if there's anybody who's struggling with what their purpose is, whether old or young or in a difficult season of life or in a really good season of life, God, you made each of us with a specific purpose in mind. I pray that we seek you, that we honor you, that we look to invest in the lives of the people that you've put around us, those neighbors, those coworkers, those friends, those family members. God, we are put in this, this world together. And we're better together. And so, God, I pray that as we leave this place this morning, that we think about those people, that we consider their needs before our own, that we love them and sacrificially give to them. And in turn, God, you you show us our meaning and our purpose while we're here. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. He loved us to the point of death on the cross, so sacrificial, so caring for us. And God, I pray if there's anybody here in this room that has not made that decision to, to say, God, I've, I've messed up, I've gone against what you said, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins to save me from them. God, I pray somebody makes that decision this morning. Be with us as we go from here. Thank you for the time we have together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.